Hello, I'm John Iskander. Welcome to the April 2014 session of CDC Public Health Grand Rounds on the topic of multidrug resistant tuberculosis. Continuing education credits are available for all Grand Round sessions. Please consult the CDC Grand Rounds website. In addition to today's outstanding featured speakers, I'd like to acknowledge the important contributions of all of the individuals listed here. Grand Rounds is happy to participate in the observance of World TB Day, which is commemorated across the globe. This year's theme, Find TB, Treat TB, Working Together to Eliminate TB, highlights that TB is still a life-threatening problem in the United States despite the declining number of TB cases. For more information, please consult the World TB Day or Emerging Infectious Diseases websites. We'll now have on videotape some introductory remarks from the CDC Director, Dr. Tom Frieden. Having personally overseen the treatment of several thousand patients with multidrug resistant tuberculosis, and having begun my career at CDC documenting the rise of drug resistance, this is a topic of particular interest to me. Patterns of tuberculosis in society often mirror the structures of that society, and patterns of drug resistance reflect the adequacy of tuberculosis treatment and the overall effectiveness of a country's public health system. The single most important concept to understand about drug-resistant tuberculosis is that no program, no matter how many resources they have, can treat drug-resistant tuberculosis faster than a poorly functioning program can create and spread drug-resistant TB. Therefore, the top priority must be prevention. Preventing the creation of new cases and preventing the spread of drug resistance, particularly in hospitals, correctional facilities, and other congregate settings. Prompt and effective treatment of patients with drug-resistant tuberculosis is also key in order to save their lives and stop them from spreading drug-resistant strains to others. All too often, tuberculosis spreads within healthcare facilities. This is a risk to both patients and healthcare workers. Now is a critical time in the fight against drug-resistant tuberculosis. We have better ways to more quickly diagnose patients. In the future, we hope to have shorter regimens and better case management strategies. But we cannot forget core tuberculosis control principles and practices. The best way to prevent MDR-TB is still to cure drug-susceptible TB and prevent transmission. Effective strategies include infection control in healthcare settings, and ensuring that patients ad adhere to treatment through directly observed therapy. We also need to encourage the use of rapid diagnostics and prompt treatment of people with drug-resistant tuberculosis. Finally, we need to invest in research and development for new drugs, new diagnostics, and ultimately a vaccine. Increasingly resistant strains of this disease put everyone at risk and we must work with the global community to address this threat. Our goal at CDC is to support both our domestic and our global partners in the fight against tuberculosis. In the U.S., we encourage medical providers to remain vigilant and aware of opportunities for prevention and of the signs and symptoms of tuberculosis. On the global front, we can help governments implement and scale up evidence-based programs and help them develop effective surveillance systems. We can also help them strengthen infection control practices, improve case management, and build effective laboratory networks. Today's Public Health Grand Rounds discusses how patients can benefit from advances in diagnostic and treatment options for drug-resistant tuberculosis, and explores the role that CDC, WHO, and other partners play in combating this epidemic. Thank you for your interest and for your work. Um, it's now my great pleasure to introduce um, a special uh, guest speaker here with us today, uh, Dr. Dalene von Delft, here with us from South Africa. Uh, and all I all, the only other thing I'd like to say by way of introduction is that 
Um, the story she will tell you is better than anything I could say about her, so I will, will yield the floor to her. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for this opportunity and for your time. Um, so my name is Deline von Delft. I'm a medical doctor from Cape Town, South Africa. Um, in the year 2010, that was my fourth year as practicing as a doctor in South Africa, I was unfortunately diagnosed with primary multidrug resistant tuberculosis. This came as quite a shock because um, I've previously been a healthy person. I've never been ill in my life. I have no comorbid diseases and I don't drink and smoke. But I saw a lot of drug resistant TB patients and um, I never really think, thought that um, I would see my name on a CT scan showing a large cavity in, in one of my lungs. I was not very ill. I didn't have lots of weight or night sweats or a productive cough. And my sputum microscopy um, specimens were repeatedly negative. But luckily I had a private medical aid and I could go to a pulmonologist who then did a bronchoscopy and a bronchial washing. And there they could find the tuberculosis. So within two days I got the correct diagnosis of multidrug resistant TB. I was resistant to three of the first line drugs. But a lot of patients in South Africa aren't so fortunate. A lot of them don't get diagnosed or the diagnosis are severely delayed. And if they get diagnosed, a lot of them don't get put on to correct treatment. So I started on seven different drugs, one an injectable agent and about 30 pills a day. And it was really tough taking this treatment. They had a lot of toxic side effects, including hypothyroidism and gout lots of nausea and vomiting. I was unfortunately not able to work while taking this treatment. It was a daily struggle to get the pills down and to fight through all the side effects. A lot of patients, they don't have the luxury to not um, be able to work. So it's very difficult for patients to work while taking this toxic regime for almost two years. Unfortunately also, two months into treatment, I developed one of the irreversible side effects of one of the drugs, the injectable agent. And this is hearing loss. So unfortunately, every week we did audiograms. My audiograms just deteriorated. And um, this was a great concern for me as a clinician because it would have meant an end to my career as a doctor because I won't be able to use my stethoscope. Luckily, I got a glimmer of hope. I heard of the first new TB drug in more than 40 years called Bedaquilin. Um, they were busy doing clinical trials in South Africa and unfortunately the, the trials were closed so I couldn't enter the trial. But I heard of a compassionate use program that opened in my country and I, I applied to um, get use of this drug on compassionate use and I was absolutely elated when it was approved. So I could stop the injectable agent and substitute it for bedaquiline. So I was able to keep he my hearing. I only have high frequency hearing loss. And today I can practice as a clinician again. But a lot of patients aren't so fortunate. So I've really become an advocate for compassionate use programs and, and for better drugs for MDR-TB. Because the drugs that we currently have, they're very toxic and it causes a lot of long-term disability for a lot of patients. And I'm really hopeful because you'll hear from all the speakers here, we've got great new innovations, new diagnostics, new drugs. And I really believe if we can accelerate these new innovations to the patients in dire need, we'll be able to relieve the suffering of a lot of patients out there. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Von Delft. Our next speaker is Dr. Sarita Shaw. Good afternoon. I'm Sarita Shaw, the Associate Chief for Science in the International Research and Programs Branch in the Division of TB Elimination. My job today is to share with you why tuberculosis, an ancient infectious disease, remains an important public health threat today. TB is caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis and can cause asymptomatic infection, also called latent TB infection, or can progress to active TB disease in approximately 10% of cases. 
TB primarily causes disease in the lungs, but can affect other sites of the body and cause clinically severe disease. TB is spread when persons with active disease expel bacteria from their lungs, for example, by coughing or sneezing. The persons at highest risk for transmission are those who share airspace with infectious patients, particularly when there's poor ventilation or prolonged exposure, such as in crowded hospitals or prisons. The primary tool for diagnosing TB is a century-old method whereby sputum is examined under a microscope to identify TB bacilli. However, this method fails to detect up to half of all TB cases, particularly among persons with HIV infection or in children. Today, we'll hear about revolutionary molecular tests that offer faster, more sensitive methods for detecting TB disease. In the pre-antibiotic era, TB was often fatal. However, following the discovery of the first anti-TB drugs in the 1940s and subsequent drug development, TB today is largely treatable and curable. Worldwide, 8.6 million new TB cases are estimated to occur each year. The majority of patients have drug susceptible TB, which is highly treatable with currently available drugs. In fact, cure rates of more than 95% can be achieved with combination therapy, which involves use of a standard four-drug antibiotic regimen. However, this is under optimal conditions when the regimen is prescribed correctly and requires an uninterrupted supply of six months of medications. In reality, case detection and cure rates under program conditions are below where they should be. Only 66% of cases were diagnosed and reported, meaning nearly 3 million were missed. Only 87% of patients were successfully cured or completed treatment. Others either failed to respond or did not complete treatment, placing them at risk for drug-resistant TB. Drug resistance in TB can occur naturally in large bacterial populations, such as those often seen in cavities in lungs of patients with TB. The combination of antibiotics used to treat TB aims to target these minority populations of resistant organisms. However, if incorrect or insufficient antibiotics are used, drug-resistant organisms are not killed and will continue to multiply. In particular, this can occur when a non-standard treatment regimen is prescribed or there's incomplete adherence to treatment, which can be due to factors such as drug shortages, drug side effects, or inadequate patient and provider education and support for completing treatment. Once drug-resistant strains are created, they are spread by airborne transmission from person to person. The vast majority of drug-resistant TB cases are caused by transmission. Transmission is exacerbated by delays in accurate diagnosis of drug-resistant TB, which require more complex, costly, and slow laboratory tests. The majority of the 8.6 million TB cases that occurred worldwide are susceptible to the standard TB drugs used for treatment. However, the burden of drug-resistant TB is high and has been increasing. Out of the 8.6 million TB cases worldwide in 2012, approximately 1 million are estimated to have any drug resistance, while 450,000 had multi-drug resistant, or MDR-TB. MDR-TB is TB that is resistant to our best first-line drugs, isoniazid and rifampin. Extensively drug resistant, or XDR-TB, is an even more resistant form of MDR-TB that has even fewer treatment options and lower cure rates approaching the pre-antibiotic era outcomes. The global emergence of XDR-TB was first identified and brought to public attention by CDC investigators in 2005 and 2006. This was followed by the alarming report from Tagela Ferry, South Africa, of 53 patients with XDR-TB and HIV co-infection. Among the 53 XDR-TB cases, nearly all died in just over two weeks. This harrowing report spurred global awareness and action to address drug-resistant TB in high HIV prevalence settings. XDR-TB has now been identified in 92 countries globally, and based on available data, it is estimated that 9.6% of MDR-TB cases have XDR-TB. The talks in today's session will focus on the global drug-resistant TB epidemic, but drug-resistant TB is a serious threat for the U.S. as well. Last year, CDC released a comprehensive report on antibiotic resistance threats in the U.S. Drug-resistant TB was classified as a serious threat. Among approximately 10,000 TB cases reported in the U.S., nearly 10% had resistance to at least one TB drug. 
This, ma this map shows the distribution of the 450,000 MDR-TB cases worldwide. The darker the orange color, the higher the burden. And what you can see is that the highest burden of MDR-TB is in India and China, shown in the dark brown, followed by Russia, shown in orange. Some of the areas with the lighter colors in Western and Sub-Saharan Africa that have reported low case counts do not yet have laboratory systems or survey results to provide accurate data, so these are likely to be underestimates. The challenge with estimating the global burden of drug-resistant TB begins with the complexities in making the diagnosis. The cornerstone of TB diagnosis worldwide still remains smear microscopy. However, this method cannot make a diagnosis of drug resistance. Instead, diagnosis requires use of culture and drug susceptibility testing, or the newer molecular tests, which Dr. Shinnick will be discussing next. The conventional culture-based methods require sophisticated laboratory infrastructure and biosafety, which presents a challenge for many high-burden TB settings. There are also patient-level challenges in TB diagnosis, which center largely on limited access to laboratory facilities that can conduct drug susceptibility testing. Lastly, the current policies in resource-limited settings severely limit who should be tested and when a test should be ordered. And while this may be understandable when faced with limited healthcare dollars, this adds to the delays in making an accurate diagnosis of drug-resistant TB, leading to patients' clinical decline and ongoing TB transmission. Taken together, these challenges in diagnosis have resulted in widespread underdiagnosis of drug-resistant TB. Only a small fraction of new or previously treated TB cases were ever tested for drug resistance. What this means is that only 20% of the total estimated MDR-TB cases were detected. This was even lower in some of the highest burden countries, such as India and China. Testing for children is even more limited due to challenges in obtaining adequate specimens. And testing for XDR-TB is also severely limited due to the additional complexity of laboratory tests for these drugs. In 2009, the World Health Assembly called for universal access to TB culture and drug susceptibility testing. Currently, however, there is a major gap in meeting this goal that will require massive laboratory and health system strengthening. Once a diagnosis of MDR-TB is made, the challenge of treatment begins. MDR-TB treatment is less effective, more toxic, takes longer, and is more costly than treating drug-susceptible TB. Despite free treatment, indirect costs to patients can consume up to a year of wages. Treatment must be taken for two years compared to six months for susceptible TB. This graphic provides a vivid image of the sheer number of pills required to treat MDR-TB for 24 months with four to five drugs daily. Further compounding this large pill burden, long duration, and cost of treatment is a very high rate of side effects from the current drugs used to treat MDR-TB. These challenges of MDR-TB treatment result in a massive gap in access to treatment. Less than one in four MDR-TB cases were diagnosed in 2012, and less than 20% were started on treatment. Of those who start treatment, the cure rates are approximately 50%, and the remainder either die, abandon treatment, or fail to respond to treatment. New drugs for drug-resistant TB are, that are more effective or can shorten treatment and have fewer side effects are urgently needed. Dr. Leanne Hurt will be discussing some of the new drugs we have for TB and TB drug development during his talk. Drug-resistant TB is a serious public health threat worldwide and causes extensive morbidity and mortality. Drug-resistant TB is difficult to diagnose and even harder to treat, even under the best of circumstances. Particularly in areas of the world with the highest burden, there are substantial economic, logistic, and policy barriers to improving diagnosis and treatment. However, the new tools you'll hear about today offer great promise for expanding access, improving care, and saving lives from this age-old, ever-evolving disease. I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Tom Shinnick. Good afternoon. I'm Thomas Shinnick, the Associate Director of the Division of TB Elimination for Global Laboratory Activities. And today, I'll talk about recent advances in laboratory testing that are improving our ability to diagnose TB. For many years, the lack of laboratory services has been a barrier to the control of TB. Only about half of new cases of TB and less than two-thirds of smear positive cases are even detected. In settings with a high occurrence of TB and HIV, detection rates are even less because smear microscopy is less sensitive for detecting postvascular TB. 
With respect to drug-resistant TB, only about 20% of the 450,000 estimated incident MDR-TB cases are laboratory confirmed, and many XDR-TB cases are not detected because of the unavailability of drug susceptible testing in many resource-limited settings. A new molecular diagnostic assay that I will speak about next is part of the solution to overcoming this barrier. The World Health Organization has endorsed two molecular assays for the detection of tuberculosis and drug resistance. Lime probe assays are approved for use with smear positive specimens and are suitable for use in reference laboratories. The Cepheid Expert MTB RIF test is endorsed for use with any pulmonary or extrapulmonary a specimen from adults and from children as well. And this test is suitable for use in district or sub-district facilities. And it's the expert test that I will discuss today. The expert test can improve TB testing because it is as sensitive and specific as one culture on solid media, such as on Lowenstein-Jensen media. The use of expert can increase TB case detection by over 40% uh, over direct smear microscopy alone. The expert test can detect both mycobacteria and tuberculosis and rifampin resistance simultaneously within two hours after starting the test, and that's compared to the weeks that's normally required to get a culture result. Sample processing is simple. With minimal hands-on time, it only requires adding sample treatment reagent to the sputum specimen, transferring two mils of the specimen to the cartridge, inserting that cartridge into one of the modules in the machine, and all the remaining steps take place automatically within the instrument. Another important advantage of the assay is that it does not require sophisticated biosafety level three facilities or specialized laboratory expertise. It has the same biosafety concerns as direct AFB smear microscopy, which means it can be placed in laboratories at the district level where it'll be easier for the patient to access these services. With respect to MDRTB, the assay detects rifampicin resistance, which we use as a proxy for MDRTB because more than 85% of rifampin resistant strains are actually MDRTB strains in most centers, especially in high burden settings. Because of the excellent sensitivity and specificity of the test in persons suspected of having MDRTB, the World Health Organization made a strong recommendation in 2011 that the expert test should be used as the initial diagnostic test in individuals suspected of having MDR-TB. Furthermore, WHO concluded that implementing expert will have a lower cost and be easier to implement than conventional culture and DST to meet the diagnostic targets for MDR-TB. Because of these features, many countries have rapidly implemented the test. And from these early implementers, we learned that the clinical and public health impact of the expert test varies according to the epidemiologic setting, the target population, the laboratory testing algorithm, and the treatment algorithm. In resource-limited settings that rely on AFB smear microscopy, the use of the expert test can increase detection of bacteriologically confirmed cases and rifampin-resistant cases, as well as reduce the time to diagnosis of MDR-TB and smear-negative TB. On the other hand, the expert test is likely to have less impact in settings where clinicians initiate treatment in the absence of bacteriologic confirmation, such as when cl clinicians rely on clinical criteria and x-ray findings for diagnosis or where culture is done for all patients. We've also learned that the private sector must be engaged. Otherwise, many TB cases will be missed because many TB cases are diagnosed in the private sector before they're notified to the public sector and treated in the public sector. We also know that diagnostic and treatment capacity need to be matched, especially in settings where the use of expert is dramatically increasing the detection of TB and MDR-TB. To realize the full potential of a new laboratory test, a systems approach is needed to strengthen all steps in the path of work. Delays in any of the steps from specimen collection to transport to the laboratory, to the laboratory testing, to reporting the results back to the clinician, to the clinician acting on the laboratory result, can reduce the impact of a new laboratory test. Delays can occur at any step, and those delays can cause clinicians to have to wait for weeks to get a result of a test that may only take two hours in the laboratory. But if that entire system is improved, then expert can have a dramatic impact on time to detect TB and to initiate appropriate therapy. 
In this study uh, done by FIND, the green bars represent the time to initiation of treatment for testing using conventional tests, smear, culture, and drug susceptibility testing. The red bars represent that for when using expert MTB RIF tests. Time to treatment was calculated from the date of the first sputum collection to the date of treatment initiation. If we look at the two bars on the left-hand side, the time to treatment for smear and expert MTB RIF were about the same, not surprising, because smear is a rapid, albeit insensitive test. If by comparing the two bars in the middle, we can see that the use of expert dramatically reduced the median time to treatment for the culture diagnosed cases from 56 days to five days. With respect to MDRTB, the expert test has the potential to reduce the time to treatment compared to conventional tests from 86 days to five days. I say potential because in this particular study, uh, the MDRTB treatment decisions relied only on the conventional DST results. To take full advantage of the promise of the expert test to increase the number of TB and MDRTB cases detected, the implementation of expert must be matched with improving the capacity of the laboratory system for conventional culture and DST for other first-line and second-line anti-TB drugs and for molecular methods such as Lyme probe assays as well. And finally, the, the entire path of work must be strengthened. Treatment capacity must be scaled up to meet the anticipated increase in the number of TB and MDR-TB cases detected, and healthcare facilities will need to enhance infection control procedures to prevent nosocomial transmission. Management of second-line drug inventories, which are already difficult, will become even more important as MDR-TB cases are detected. In summary, the lack of laboratory services remains a barrier to an effective response to TB and MDR-TB. Recent advances in molecular diagnostics hold promise for overcoming that barrier, and because of that promise, the WHO recommends the use of T the expert test for the initial diagnostic test in persons suspected of having MDR-TB. The use of this test should increase the detection of TB and MDR-TB cases and shorten the time to initiation of therapy in many of our high burden countries. To realize the full benefit of the test, treatment and control programs must be scaled up in parallel with the increased use of the expert test. With that, I thank you for your attention and call up our next speaker, Christian Leinhardt. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Christian Linhart from uh, the World Health Organization, where I work at the Global TB Program, and I'm particularly in charge of uh, the aspects related to new drugs and new regimens for uh, tuberculosis. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank the organizer of this event to have invited me to speak about the rational use of the new drugs and new regimens for the treatment of MDR -TB tuberculosis, and especially the context and the challenges that we are confronted with. This is the Global TB Drug Pipeline. As you can see, we have a series of uh, compounds between, which are being uh, tested presently. Quite a lot of compounds upstream in uh, discovery and preclinical development. And very good for us and for TB patients, uh, we have a series of compounds down the line under the late phase two and phase three trial uh, development phases. What can be seen here is that these drugs, which are on your right-hand side in phase two and phase three trials, are mainly a series of new drugs or repurposed drugs, that mean drugs which are uh, known and being used for uh, antimicrobial antibacterial activity, but that are now being tested to, uh, uh, for treatment of tuberculosis because of uh, new uh, discovery of mycobacterial activity. There has been quite a large uh, effort done over the last 10 years, which are produce these various compounds, but as you can see in phase one, one trial, there is presently no TB drugs currently in being testing. So this is together a good sign. We have a series of compounds down the line, but a little bit of a worry because we have nothing coming after if some of these compounds which are in late phase of development do not make it to treat tuberculosis. Two compounds are here highlighted and boxed. These are uh, bedaquiline and delamanide which uh, have been approved by a regulatory authority, and I'm going to tell you about this in more detail. 
The first new drug, betaquiline, and that has been mentioned to you by Dr. Dalin van Delt before me, is a complete new drug, and it's quite a fantastic event in the sense that it's the first new TB drug over a generation over 40 years. It's a new chemical class, it's a direct quinoline, and it has a novel target uh, as it acts on the, it's an ATP synthase inhibitor, so it works really on the energy pump of the bacteria. The drug has been tested in phase 2B trial using a new novel design in tuberculosis. The drug has been given on top of a background therapy here for treatment of uh, multidrug resistant tuberculosis and versus placebo on top of background therapy as well. The primary endpoint was time to sputum conversion and the proportion with sputum conversion at six months. The trial showed greater efficacy of background therapy with beta quinine compared to background therapy with placebo. However, there were some safety concerns, mainly cardiotoxicity and uh, hepatotoxicity, and there was also some concern due to the fact that an excess mortality was found in the test arm versus the control arm. The pros and cons of the drugs, the balance of risk and benefit have left the FDA under an accelerated procedure to approve the drug in December 2012 as part of a combination therapy to treat adults with multidrug resistant tuberculosis when other alternatives are not available. Because of this quite giant step in treatment of tuberculosis, the World Health Organization has decided to review the data and see whether we should uh, um, recommend the use of beta for the treatment of MDR-TB and update our guidelines for treatment of multidrug resistant tuberculosis. Due to the safety concerns, but balancing the overall um, way uh, benefits versus the risk, the WHO has decided to recommend for the use of multidrug resistant of beta for multidrug resistant tuberculosis, but under five strict conditions. These are the following: that first treatment should be given under close monitoring. The patient should be properly selected and uh, have situation of multidrug resistant tuberculosis with additional problems such as uh, additional resistance to fluoroquinolone or to aminoglycosides or intolerance to one of these drugs. The patient should be informed of the novel uh, aspects of the treatment and therefore an informed consent should be required. The treatment should be designed based on WHO recommendations with a clear definition of the companion drugs to be associated for the treatment. And due to the problem of safety, an active pharmacovigilance system should be introduced. These uh, recommendations have been published in June 2013, and in order to really assist with the implementation of the drug and making sure that it is being introduced in countries in a way that follows this recommendation and that it could be helpful as much as possible to TB patients, the World Health Organization has started to work with a series of countries, so-called pathfinding countries, who have decided to work with us and implementing beta following these recommendations. The second new drug, which is worthwhile mentioning, is Delamanid, which is a chemical class uh, nitroimidazole. And this uh, drug has been uh, tested in a similar way as uh, for betaquiline. It was uh, tested on top of optimized background therapy and compared with uh, placebo on top, of, uh, on top of optimized background therapy. Two doses have been tested. The primary endpoint was the two months sputum culture conversion. And here again, the phase two trial has showed the greater efficacy of, op of the delamanid plus optimized background therapy versus placebo. A phase three trial has been launched in uh, September 2011 and is being currently conducted. This drug has been submitted for regulatory approval to the European Medicine Agencies, EMEA, which has approved the drugs in December 2013. Here again, as part of an appropriate combination regimen for pulmonary multidrug resistant tuberculosis in adult patient when an effective treatment regimen cannot otherwise be composed for reasons of resistance or tolerability. So here again, as you can see, either delamanid or beta have been approved by for a very specific category of patients who are multidrug resistant tuberculosis but have additional problems. The drug has not been approved yet by the FDA. But due to the fact it has been approved by the MEA and will be, there will be increasing demand in accessing the drug, the World Health Organization has decided to look at the uh, added value of this drug for the treatment of uh, multidrug resistant tuberculosis, and the review is next month uh, in Geneva. 
There are a series of public health challenges that one has to contemplate when uh, thinking of introducing new drugs in countries. As new drugs are being produced and come out of the development pipeline, and as tuberculosis is being treated as, uh, by a regimen, by a combination of drugs, the first thing we have to ask ourselves is what are the optimal regimens, what is uh, the optimal companion drugs that should be associated so that the drug can be introduced uh, properly. And how much can we make sure that this is being done in a feasible way under programmatic conditions? We have to evaluate the patient eligibility requirements, whether there are new requirements, like for instance, uh, betaquiline due to the toxicity aspect, we have to do an electrocardiogram to patients, so how much feasible it is to do it and to monitor treatment with electrocardiogram. So all that has to be evaluated and again, with a concern of uh, programmatic feasibility. And last but not least, if we have new drugs, then we have to make sure that they are accessible and we have to look at the affordability of the drugs and then evaluate the cost effectiveness of the treatment. We have also to make sure that uh, proper surveillance is being done and proper pharmacovigilance. And again, especially in the case of accelerated approval, like uh, the FDA has been doing uh, with betaquiline, because the data that are uh, examined by the regulatory authorities are rather limited, so it's important that safety data are being collected in the real world. So safety monitoring is important, is being done for betaquiline. It's important to ensure responsible use. We are in a situation where we get new drugs, so it's very good for patients, but we want to protect the drugs as well. We want to make sure that uh, the, the drug will not be jeopardized by a rapidly increased emergence to that new drug. So we have to make sure that there is proper use and that there is, not, there is no misuse and off-label use of the drug. We should make sure that there is uh, use according to appropriate indication, dose, drug combination, and treatment duration. And last but not least, we have to work with all people and all civil society representatives and so, and the Ministers of Health in various countries to encourage equitable access to the treatment for the patients in need. There are new aspects also, which are the fact of reconsidering the way we are treating presently with the current drugs we have. And uh, we can use these uh, drugs that we have or repurpose one and try them in new combination to try and see whether we can improve treatment of tuberculosis. There are some series of trials and studies which have been carried out. And uh, for instance, here you have in front of you a series in Bangladesh where various combinations of drugs have been tested. And the best outcome was obtained with a nine months therapy composed of seven drugs during four months and then followed by four drugs during five months. So this combination, as can be seen here, has been tested together with a series of others. And this combination, the one I mentioned of nine months duration, which is the, uh, the combination number six, has been shown among 200 patients to be associated with a cure rate of 82.5% and a completion rate of 5.3%. So there was a high proportion of patients with a successful outcome with this uh, uh, combination, which is only based on drugs which are currently available. So in order to test this, this further, because this was an observational study, so a cohort of patients being followed up, in order to test it further, uh, a trial is being conducted uh, currently called the STREAM trial, which is testing this nine months regimen versus the standard of care proposed by the World Health Organization, which is about 20 months dur duration. The new point is uh, to consider here, as has been mentioned uh, by Dr. Shah, is uh, the issue of XDRTB, which was defined in 2006 and is estimated to occur about in 10% of MDRTB patients. The problem is that there is lack of evidence for the best drug regimens to be treating these patients with XDRTB. Lack of evidence, but we have some type of review, and uh, the recent review of treatment health comes has been looking at whether some regimens or some drugs were associated with a better outcome. And unfortunately, there was no such sign that uh, specific drugs or treatment regimens could be associated with successful outcomes. The only thing that we could see is that there was a success which was highest if at least six drugs should be used in intensive phase and four being used in continuation phase. So it's uh, the treatment of XDRTB can be successful, it's possible, but it requires an early and accurate diagnosis of the resistance to the second-line drugs. It requires the availability of multiple class of second-line drugs, 
and access to clinicians who have special expertise in treating XDRTB cases. There are two other problems uh, which we need to contemplate when one speaks about the treatment of uh, MDRTB, and especially the, these are the situation in children. The pediatric formulation of the current drugs uh, are not optimal. We don't know very much about how, much, uh, how many children present MDRTB. There, there are few estimates on the burden of disease in children. It is estimated to be about 6 to 10 percent of the adult burden. But we don't include that here, no, no, children exposed to drug resistant TB. The current diagnostics resources are quite limited. Expert, has been introduced by Dr. Shinik before, has been shown to be useful. But we are limited with uh, limited notions of uh, pharmacokinetic, few information on pharmacokinetic, few child-friendly formulations. We have also impaired by uh, TB treatment programs which are often separate from the child health programs. We are hampered by a lack of capacity and the lack of expertise among the care providers. We are also hampered by limited funding. There is a small proportion of children actually treated, much less than what could be done, but the results of some studies showed that globally we have a very good outcome. For instance, a study showed that among 315 patients there was a success rate of 81%. Another aspect which needs to be addressed is uh, the issue about preventive therapy for the contacts of MDR and XDRTB cases, as was mentioned by Dr. Frieden at the introductory talk of this uh, event. There is quite robust evidence to support the efficacy of ionizing preventive therapy to reduce the risk of disease progression in child and uh, adult contacts of drug susceptible TB. There are really ample uh, signs of evidence, and there are presently trials being carried out to reduce the, the possibility to uh, prevent development of tuberculosis using other combination of drugs like rifampicin, isoniazid, for instance. And these are trials which have been carried out by the CDC. So there is good evidence about the possibility to prevent tuberculosis among contacts of drug suitable TB cases. But as we look at the evidence among the contact of MDRTB, then we are really absolutely struck with the fact that there is absolutely no randomized trial being carried out so far. We have some studies, like a pediatric cohort that has been carried out in uh, South Africa in Cape Town, where uh, children were treated with, either with a combination of isoniazid, ethambutone, and ofloxacin. And among 168 children, the regimen were well tolerated, and only 3.2% of these uh, children developed active TB. So there is signs that we can get uh, an efficient prevention. There is uh, also data from an outbreak investigation in Micronesia, where five MDRTB cases were being notified and 119 uh, adults and children were contact were being followed up. They were followed up and they were all offered preventive therapy for 12 months using either fluoroquinolone alone or with another agent. And remarkably, none of the one of four contacts who received preventive therapy developed TB, but three of the 15 untreated contacts progressed to disease. So there is really room for testing, for trying to find out what would be the best way to prevent tuberculosis. And the randomized control trial study is at presently at the late stage of development to assess preventive therapy with isoniazid or levofloxacin in children exposed to drug resistant tuberculosis in South Africa. So preventive therapy for contacts of MDRTB, especially in children, is an area of much needed research. So in terms of conclusion, they are all very good signs of progress. We have two newly approved medications for treatment of MDRTB that have been uh, approved by uh, regulatory authorities and are available for treatment. These are beta and delamanid. However, we have seen that they are being advised only for a certain subgroup of the MDRTB patient, and they need to be looked at how it's feasible to be treating those patients under field conditions. There are multiple scientific program challenges that need to be addressed because we need to see how these drugs are being applicable in real world conditions. New combinations of existing and repurposed medicine show potential for treatment shortening of MDRTB, like I've showed with the so-called Bangladesh studies. So further trials need to be done. There are areas that require additional investigation, and these include treatment of XDR tuberculosis, pediatric regimens to treat MDRTB and preventive therapy for contacts of both MDR and XDRTB cases. With this, I leave the word to the next speaker, Dr. Tom Kenyon. Thank you very much.
Well, good afternoon. Um, I'm Tom Kenyon, the director of the Center for Global Health. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to summarize and describe what more we can be doing about MDR-TB going forward. Also, special thanks to Dr. Dr. Von Dell for sharing her personal story and adding additional urgency to this, to this situation. So how did we get here with respect to drug-susceptible TB? And unlike SARS or influenza, for which epidemic curves are measured in, in weeks or months, TB is a global epidemic that's evolved on a time scale of, of, of centuries. For hundreds of years, TB was a, a major cause of mortality throughout the world. The 19th century included advances in TB diagnostics, while the 20th century included dramatic advances in, in TB treatment, incremental advances in TB diagnosis, as well as the advent of DNA sequencing, particularly around outbreaks of drug-resistant TB in congregate settings. In fact, there's, there's been considerable progress over the past decade. From 2000 to 2012, worldwide TB incidence decreased by over 15% from 148 to 122 cases per 100,000 population. Prevalence and mortality decreased even more in relative terms. And these all reflect impressive increases in case detection and treatment success rates. So the good news is that we've either met or we are on track to meet three of the five Millennium Development Goals around TB by 20, 2015 in terms of TB incidence, mortality, and treatment, and we will come very close to meeting the fourth one on case detection. So how did we get here with respect to drug-resistant TB? Before the end of the 20th century, the TB bacillus had outsmarted our therapeutic tools in the form of drug-resistant bacilli. As Dr. Shaw explained the magnitude of this problem, the global community then responded with development of the global project on anti-TB drug resistance surveillance, followed by pro pilot projects to introduce the management and treatment of drug resistant TB in middle and low income countries. In 2009, the World Health Assembly for the first time declared that all TB cases should be appropriately diagnosed and treated. The previous strategy had focused on microscopy for diagnosis, which was and continues to be highly practical and inexpensive for detecting most of the infectious cases of TB, but was much less effective in children and in HIV-infected persons, especially with smear-negative TB, and it was completely unable to, di to distinguish drug-susceptible from drug-resistant TB. Today, with the new tools described by Dr. Shinnick and Dr. Leonard, services for drug-resistant TB are being scaled up worldwide at an unprecedented pace. In a short four-year span, among the estimated 450,000 incident MDR-TB cases worldwide, the proportion detected and treated increased by 5%, mainly in affluent countries, to 20%, including most of the world's countries. The unfortunate news is that we are nowhere near the 2015 goals for case detection, case notification, and treatment success that have been outlined in the global plan to stop TB. We are on the verge, however, of a transformational change in the management of and global approach to drug-resistant TB. First, we are enjoying unprecedented leadership on the part of global policymaking bodies, followed by the requisite political commitment in countries throughout the world. The political support is realistic today because of unprecedented financial support through the Global Fund PEPFAR, and other sources of investment. Amidst this background, new and improved diagnostics and therapeutics are being taken to scale together to create a remarkable synergy that promises a sea change in the development of services for both drug-resistant and drug-susceptible TB worldwide. For example, this graph shows in the blue bars the number of gene expert instrument modules that have been installed, and in the red line, the number of expert cartridges that have been procured in middle and low-income countries, 
with discounted pricing from the manufacturer. Nearly 10,000 instrument modules and over 4 million test cartridges in a period of only three years. Maximizing the benefit of a sensitive diagnostic test such as EXPERT requires strength in health systems, particularly ensuring that people with positive test results are placed on treatment promptly. These brilliant advances in diagnostics and therapeutics should not, however, distract us from placing fundamental importance on prevention, both primary prevention and secondary prevention. Primary prevention of drug-resistant TB is most important. Further strengthening basic TB control services is our best hope for preventing the creation of new drug-resistant TB cases. Through prompt identification and effective treatment of drug-resistant cases, their infectiousness decreases rapidly and we can prevent further transmission. Moreover, with renewed attention to infection control practices, hospitals and other congregate settings will become less hazardous as hotspots for MDR-TB transmission. For secondary prevention, among the new drugs recently approved or currently in the pipeline, we may identify treatment that could be administered to infected contacts of active cases that would prevent them from developing active, infectious, drug-resistant TB disease. But this is an area that needs further research. However, in spite of this hopeful outlook, we still face considerable obstacles. While microscopy laboratories are available and accessible in even the most report remote corners of the world, the more complex procedures of classic culture and drug susceptibility testing are generally confined to large urban population centers. Similarly, highly effective treatment with quality assured second line drugs is limited to few centers with specialized expertise. And until the past two years, there have been no clinical trials focusing on MDR-TB. Therefore, the availability of new drugs also creates the opportunity for clinical trials of novel combinations of drugs to treat drug-resistant TB. A recent CDC-led observational cohort study of MDR-TB patients quantified the extent to which XDR-TB can develop during treatment. 7.9% of cases actually had XDR-TB even before they started treatment for MDR-TB. A further 8.9% of patients developed XDR-TB during treatment for MDR-TB. The good news is that the same study showed that such acquired resistance can probably be prevented by diligent attention to proper diagnosis, treatment, and case management as evidenced by WHO's Greenlight Committee's evaluation and approval. In the GLC group, only 3.7% acquired XDR-TB treatment versus 15.6% in a comparison group of programs that were not GLC approved. However, acquired resistance is only a small part of the story. There's alarming evidence that now suggests the vast majority of incident MDR-TB and XDR-TB cases developed through primary transmission of drug-resistant isolates. WHO estimates 74% of MDR-TB cases globally arise from direct transmission. A study in China suggested 78% of MDR-TB cases arose from primary transmission of MDR-TB. Furthermore, a meta-analysis concluded that 90% of XDR-TB cases had no prior history of treatment for MDR-TB. In other words, they were infected with XDR-TB strains in the first place. This clearly underscores the importance of infection control in congregate settings such as hospitals and prisons. In the largest reported cluster of XDR-TB among 28 patients with matching TB genotypes, 79% have been exposed to one or more infectious XDR-TB patients on the hospital wards with a median overlap of 18 patient days in the hospital. The social network structure for the cluster of cases admitted to the female wards is shown here, illustrating lines of XDR-TB transmission. 
The red circles and the red lines show five generations of transmission just from a single case in the lower left to four other individuals who went on to spread to other individuals. So what can we do? CDC is now partnering with USAID to provide technical assistance to a dozen or more countries that have global fund grants to scale up their MDR-TB services. The new model of TA will consist of long-term strengthening of local human resource capacity instead of the traditional fly-in, fly-out types of evaluation missions that are relatively ineffective. The recent global health security agenda will also provide a new opportunity to elevate the response to MDR and XDR-TB, which are included in this agenda. The prevent, detect, and respond model for global health security lends itself well to XDR and MDR-TB as we've discussed here today. And Uganda included this among the pathogens they selected, and so we should have some lessons learned very soon from including MDR and XDR-TB into a global health security approach. In conclusion, looking forward to the future beyond the 2015 benchmark for the MDGs, the global strategy for TB control will rest on three pillars. First, integrated patient-centered TB care and prevention. Secondly, bold policies and supportive systems. And third, intensive research and innovation. And CDC will remain committed to these pillars going forward. Thank you for your attention. For those in the room, please uh, use the microphones. Okay, we have a question from social media. Yes, from our online audiences. I saw only 5 to 9% get tested for MDR-TB. What do you think is the estimated national rate for MDR-TB? The national rate in the United States usually is around 1 to 2 percent per year, pretty consistently. But in the United States, everyone is tested. Uh, globally, the numbers are among the people who are notified, so that we know that they are TB cases, about uh, 28 percent are actually tested. And so when you do all the calculations, that gives up, we think less than 10 percent of our total number of cases are being detected with laboratory confirmation. Um, there have been a number of reports um, and studies that have highlighted the potential role of counterfeit medication, falsified drugs, you know, substandard drugs in resistance in infectious diseases such as TB. And I was wondering what role do you think counterfeits actually might play in resistance in TB? And if it does play a significant role, what would be appropriate CDC action uh, to address the issue? You can get back to me later. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think that the point you made is absolutely very valid. and. Uh, I don't have any figure to uh, say how much it is concurring to the problem, but it's true that the use of counterfeit drugs and uh, suboptimal and uh, low quality drug and antibiotics for treatment drug susceptible TB might have a role in the generation of uh, drug resistance. So that's, uh, I think it's one of the contribution to the emergence of resistance. Now, about how much uh, CDC can take that on, then I will leave my partners here to respond. Uh, I won't directly respond to that, but I will tell what the WHO is doing and the Stop TB Partnership is, we do have something called the Global Drug Facility, and that is a source for 
uh, primarily for the second line drugs. You can get some first line drugs there as well. And these are drugs that have been mat manufactured under good laboratory or good manufacturing processes and have been uh, quality assured. And uh, they are good quality drugs that the WHO provides to, to countries to use for their treatment programs. Studies showed that uh, supervised therapy uh, in the 1960s and 1970s could ensure completion in the prevention of drug resistance. Uh, yet it took the MDR-TB outbreaks in the 1990s to change the paradigm in this country to ensure uh, therapy with supervision. Uh, to what extent has that paradigm been adopted at WHO for uh, drug resistant patients and uh, uh, in other words, what's the extent of uh, use of uh, supervised therapy and what role does that play in uh, your uh, strategy or, or model? Or to put it another way, uh, if drugs, con <laughs> no, if drugs much, continue to be available um, at pharmacies or wherever on the black market, uh, without ensuring that patients take it, the uh, number of drug-resistant patients go is going to continue to uh, uh, increase. In other words, how are we ensuring that the patients take the drugs? There has been a lot of um, strategies developed to ensure the proper treatment of tuberculosis, and one of the first attempts was the so-called DOTS, directly observed therapy short course, that has been supported and promoted, launched by WHO already back in the uh, late 90s and the beginning of the 2000s. It's all about the fact that to ensure that patients go to the right place, to the treatment centers, and to collect the drugs, and that's the patient is being accompanied in order to make sure that the patient comes back to the health centers to collect the drugs. The drug being given under supervision. Alternative ways have been uh, tried in order to make sure that the patient can take the drugs even if the patient doesn't come to the, uh, to the health center. So these are uh, alternative ways of uh, looking for support from the families or from so supporters in the community, etc. So there has been a series of uh, attempts to try to make sure that the patient does take the drug. The second thing is about uh, uh, the, the fact that the patient does take the right drugs, and that's, uh, as Dr. Schinick says, all the efforts that we've been doing now with the Global Drug Facility, and that has been mentioned by Dr. Kenyon, is to make sure that the drugs being used are properly uh, quality-assured drugs. The third aspect is what we call the PPM, the public-private mix, which is uh, um, a system by which we try to work with private practitioners, with the private uh, sector, to make sure that the patients who are seen outside of the government services do have access, again, to right tests and right drugs and take the, the treatment properly. So these are a series of attempts, of strategies, in order to convince the private sector where we can see that uh, the, the tests are not being optimal, the diagnosis tests are not being optimal, or the treatment are not being optimal, or optimally given to patients that they follow the recommendation for treatment of uh, tuberculosis. Thank you. I'd like to thank all of our uh, speakers uh, once again for their outstanding presentations. Uh, please join us in five weeks for the April Public Health Grand Rounds. <laughs>